So unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably heard about this Pfizer vaccine, this mRNA vaccine, and uh, that it's 90% effective. Well, I want to go through what an mRNA vaccine is, and I want to, you know, put the brakes on a little bit here because it's not all as good as you've been led to believe. So let's first quickly talk about virus. What's a virus? Well, a virus is a bit of uh, DNA or RNA that is sort of usually surrounded by this sort of lipid bilayer thing with some proteins on the outside of it and stuff. And these little boogers, they get into you and they attach to your cells by little spiky bits. In the case of uh, COVID-19, we call it the spike protein, but lots of these viruses have these spiky things. They attach to a receptor on your cell and they go in there and then they take over the machinery of the cell and they reproduce themselves by taking little pieces of mRNA and inserting into this thing called a ribosome. And that ribosome makes lots of protein copies and makes copies of the virus. Because viruses are stupid. In fact, viruses are not actually alive, but they are able to replicate if they can get into you. All right? Now, every sort of animal, every bacteria, even other viruses get infected by viruses. So viruses are actually ubiquitous throughout nature. So the COVID-19 virus, uh, we don't like. So let's talk about the vaccine and how vaccines work. So we've had vaccines for tens of years, decades and decades, we've had different types of vaccines. And the old school way of making a vaccine is you, you take that virus, you somehow change it, you attenuate it so it's weaker, and then you inject it into people and that weak virus replicates, you get an immune response so that then if you come in contact with the real virus, you can kill it very quickly. Or you can take that virus and basically kill it and just sort of inject those dead virus things back into a person. And again, immune response so that then if you get infected by the real thing, you'll have a quick immune response and kill it. Or you take just pieces of that virus that you think are the most important things to have an immune response against and you package them up, put them in a vaccine, <coughs> inject it into people, and then you get immunity. Well, there's a whole bunch of new ways of uh, producing vaccines. And Today, we'll just talk about the mRNA vaccines that are being produced. This one by Pfizer. The other person you or people you've heard about is Moderna. So the mRNA vaccine is really very interesting. So when this virus, COVID or SARS-CoV-2, was found in China, uh, these smart Chinese scientists, they actually sequenced the genome of the entire virus and they published it. That was huge. So then all these other smart scientists around the world could now, basically, they didn't need the virus itself, but they had the genome. And they found that part of the genome called the S part of the genome, which actually encodes for the spike protein. So on the outside of SARS-CoV-2 um, is the spike protein. Now that's the little spiky bit that attaches to your cells, to the ACE receptor binder of your cells and boom, and now it can inject itself into your cell, take over that cell and replicate a whole bunch of new virus that then spread out and infect other cells. So we've got that little piece of RNA and we can make spike protein. So what Pfizer did, well actually it wasn't Pfizer, it was BioNTech. What BioNTech has been doing for about the last decade has been working on vaccines using mRNA not just for viruses, but also for cancers, for example. So they've really sort of dialed in this technology and then Pfizer is a big company with lots of money and distribution and all that stuff. So now they're working together. So what they did is that they took that little piece of mRNA and then they put on the end of it this thing called the five prime cap and then the poly A tail. And then they covered this thing in nano lipid particles. So a little bit of fat things around them. So now they have this mRNA, which is inside this little bit of lipid and then they can do their tests on it. So the first thing they tested on was rats and mice. And what they wanted to see is if by inserting this mRNA into these animals, whether that mRNA would go into their cells and then get picked up by the ribosomes and start cranking out the spike proteins, which would then be released from the cell or on the outside of the cell, and antibodies would be formed. Well, they did that in the mice and the monkeys, and they found, voila, it worked. In fact, the levels of antibody by injecting these animals with this mRNA vaccine were 10 to 20 times what you'd get from a natural infection. So that was the first part, like, ooh, this could actually work. Hey, Mel, just wait one second. I've got to do a bit further explanation. Come over here. So the implication of that that I, shouldn't have, that I should have said more clearly is that now you've got all these antibodies that you've produced when the SARS-CoV-2 virus comes into your body, now you've got these antibodies that attach to the spike protein and they can't get in to the cell. 
So that's huge, right? So now when you get infected or somebody coughs on you, that virus wants to get in the cell, but you already have a huge titer of antibodies that grab the spike protein and the virus cannot get into the cell. And it also takes out another step. Instead of having to create that vaccine in a hen or a chicken egg or whatever it is, and then put it into people and then wait for the immune response, you take out that section, right? So theoretically, it makes it much more efficient to produce the vaccine. Mel, you can continue. I'm going back into my house. So then they went into stage you know, one and two trials in humans. And what you do there is you take a small number of volunteers and you inject this into them and you ask a couple of questions. Is it safe? And uh, does it produce an immune response? It was published in the New England Journal. It wasn't a lot of people, about 195 people. And they had groups of 15 and 12 in each group got the vaccine and three got placebo. And then uh, they gave it at different doses. And they basically found, yes, it produces an antibody response, which is really good. And they also looked at um, you know, two different types of this vaccine and decided that the second type that they were working on was the best one. And that was the BNT162B2 version. So that's the one that Pfizer and, uh, is working on now. And the other thing that they looked at in this first series of phase one and phase two trials was side effects, really important. So they looked at sort of the local things. Did it hurt? Did you get some redness? And the answer was, yeah, you got some redness at the site. But then they watched people over longer and they asked, like, did you get a viral syndrome? And the answer was yes. And a lot of people got a mild viral syndrome, aches and pains and a little bit of fatigue, but nothing bad. But again, that was only in about, you know, just under 200 people. So now we're starting to hear the reports of the third phase of the trial. So the phase three, this is where they took over 43,000 patients and they injected them with this new mRNA virus. And then they asked themselves the question, is this gonna work? Now, the paper has not been published. The study is not finished. But when you do a study this big, you have this thing called interim analysis. So after a certain number of people have been sort of exposed to the virus and have symptoms, you do an interim analysis. So the first interim analysis was at 94 confirmed cases. And I'm going to get back to this. They're going to do another one at 120. And then the study is finished when they've had 164 people who have confirmed to be infected with the virus. And then they stop and they look at the safety and they look at the effectiveness. So they came out in a press release. This is not uncommon. They came out in a press release and said, look, we did our first interim anal analysis and our vaccine is 90% effective and appears to be safe. Now, here's the problem. This was a press release. This is not a peer-reviewed journal. Other scientists haven't been able to look at the data and break it down. That won't happen for a while. I'm sure that they're getting ready for publication and then they'll do another analysis when they've finished this study, which is not done yet. It's going to take some more time to get this completely finished. But here's the most important thing and the question that I've been asking myself. What does it mean by 90% effective? Well, here's how the study worked. So everybody got into their groups, the placebo group, or they got into the vaccine group. So you have one dose now, and then you have one dose 28 days later. And then seven days after that, they start asking people about their symptoms. So if people are becoming symptomatic, and that sounds like maybe they've got COVID, they've got the cough, they've got the shortness of breath, they've got sort of the viral-like syndrome. If you reported, yes, I think I might have it, then they uh, grabbed you and brought you back to the lab and tested you to see if you had, if you had uh, SARS-CoV-19. And then they, you know, found those people. And they found, this time, like 94 of those people. And then they looked at, did they get the vaccine? Did they not get the vaccine? And it turns out, that if you got the vaccine, you are 90% less likely to become symptomatic with SARS-CoV-2 to get COVID-19. So this was a study of whether this vaccine can reduce you getting symptoms from being infected with the virus. This was not a study to determine whether this could prevent severe disease, whether this, the, whether this could present admission to the ICU, whether it could prevent death, whether it could even prevent asymptomatic spread. It was simply a study because they wanted to go fast about how to reduce symptomatic infection. That's all. So that's the first and most important gotcha. We don't know if this reduces asymptomatic spread. We don't know if this will reduce death. We don't know if this will reduce the number of patients who need to go to the hospital or go into the ICU. That's really, really important to understand. It's a criticism of the study. But it's also something that people say, well, those studies take too long. They need even more patients 
and would take years to produce. So let's do this interim thing. Okay, so uh, when they do their analysis later on, they'll look at those other endpoints for sure. But initially, that's what that 90% effectiveness means. It doesn't mean anything more than we made about 90% of people less feeling sick when they got infected with SARS-CoV-2. But that's not the only gotcha, and it's important to understand. A couple of other gotchas with this vaccine. This mRNA vaccine with its nanolipid particles around it and uh, the little RNA in the inside has to keep be frozen, basically, at minus 70 Celsius or minus 100 Fahrenheit or it falls apart. And if you put it into a regular fridge, it lasts less than 24 hours. Now, this produces a big logistics problem, which is being worked on right now. You've got to get tremendous amounts of this vaccine out to people, but those type of refrigerators do not exist at your doctor's hospital. Uh, they do not exist uh, at the pharmacy down the road. They exist in big medical centers, in big research centers. And so that's the first problem, the logistics of this. Now, they are working on that, but that is a big deal. It's much different than if it's like a vaccine that can be just refrigerated or not even refrigerated at all. The other gotcha is that uh, Pfizer has said that they're only going to be able to have about 50 million doses, which is a lot, but only 50 million doses of this, which means they can only give it to 25 million people by the end of this year. And who's that going to go to? That will end up going to frontline healthcare workers, other essential workers, and maybe some of the highest risk patients. If you're not in a particularly high risk group, if you're not in a healthcare group, you're not going to see this vaccine until spring or summer. And that's just in the US. If we really want to get rid of this pandemic and try and get back to something like the new normal, we have to give this to everybody in the world. So the good thing is that Moderna has a very, very similar vaccine. Wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. Because as I was putting this together, it turns out Moderna just this morning released their preliminary results. So the Moderna vaccine is very similar to the Pfizer vaccine. It's an mRNA vaccine, same process. The lipid sort of uh, nanoparticles are a little bit different. That's the only difference that I can tell between the two. They did a 30,000 patient randomized study, placebo or vaccine with a planned interim analysis after 95 people were confirmed ill with the disease. And they found that it reduced that by 95-ish percent. So very, very similar to the Pfizer vaccine. There's probably not going to be much difference between these two. But the good news here is that in this interim analysis, they also looked at uh, 11 cases of what they called severe disease. And none of those cases occurred in the vaccine group. And the side effect profile, much like the Pfizer one, some soreness, some aches and pains, but nothing bad. So again, this is a press release. This hasn't been peer reviewed. Um, this is just an interim analysis. Many more patients are going to be uh, put through that study because they also want to get up well past 100, 150 cases. But this is increasing evidence that these vaccines work. And now we have a little bit of evidence about something that we really care about. Will it reduce severe disease? So the summary. Um, these vaccines are looking good. The side effect profile right now looks good. It looks like they're effective in reducing symptomatic disease. There is now some evidence that maybe it will reduce severe disease. We don't know if it's going to reduce mortality. The other good thing about the Moderna study is that they included a lot of black and Latino patients who we know are at very high risk as also diabetics and stuff as well. Um, we haven't studied this in kids. The Pfizer study, I believe, was over the age of 12, Moderna over the age of 18. But we're starting to get some information here and there's going to be many more vaccines coming, protein-based vaccines, virus-based vaccines, more mRNA vaccines that are coming and we will continue to do analysis on the, uh, this. But this morning, at least, things are looking uh, pretty good. All right, we'll do more analysis of this stuff when it comes up. Herbert out.